I want to share. Uh, I, I want to share a real blessing this week. Um, Tuesday, when uh, when I came home Tuesday evening, Shelly was uh, was meeting with a delightful young lady in our home. Her name is uh, Juliet. All you got to do is remember Romeo. All right, <laughs> you, can, you can remember her name. Um, I had briefly met Juliet, I believe, one other time. I think your church. Uh, but really didn't know anything about her. They had been visiting for uh, over an hour and uh, talking about things of faith. And uh, when I walked in, they said, we've been waiting for you. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, we could have gotten here sooner. And they said, no, we're waiting because Juliet does not believe she's ever invited Jesus Christ into her life. And over the next 10 minutes, we talked about what that looks like. And Juliet then prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. Amen. Nothing Amen. but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> I, I asked Juliet if I had the permission to do this. And she said yes, because I don't like to embarrass anybody. Would you mind standing, Juliet, just for a moment? This is Juliet. She is all human understanding. So everything else around us looks like it's spinning out of control. The one who is in control lives inside of you. And so I just want us to give a word of thanks today, all right, for our new member of the family. So would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, I love you so much. I thank you for the surprises that you bring into our life. And uh, the surprise was being able to see a birth take place last Tuesday night. To see Julia, who... Uh, um, who was a, just a delightful person, and a great neighbor, and a good friend. Um, see her become your child. What a very special privilege that was. Um, the scripture says that some, uh, some plant seeds of faith. And that's been happening in Juliet's life with her husband, with her neighbors, with others. And some come along and add a little bit of water to it. And, and then the scripture says, you, you delight in bringing about the increase, the growth. And so new birth took place Tuesday night. Thank you. We trust you for Juliet's needs. Uh, we pray for your strength to be evident in her life. The evil one is going to plant doubts. And uh, Father, we want her to be assured of your unconditional love for her. May she know that you will never leave her nor forsake her. You are with her every moment of every day. You will be her joy. You will be her peace. You will be her love. You will be her foundation. So we just say thank you for all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm not supposed to be talking today. I'm really not here. Uh, actually, Mark, Mark's going to be preaching today. Mark is handling things. I had some knee surgery. And uh, the doctor said either choose Sunday morning or Sunday night. So I'm preaching tonight. All right? So 6 o'clock. Hope to see you. Mark, I will not say another word the rest of the service. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is a pretty busy campus through the whole week, so so you can find out what we do, not just here on Sunday mornings. Uh, we have a few announcements starting tonight. There is um, Sunday night church, so Tim is preaching, and um, he didn't really have a choice because uh, Chris and I both had a town later on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he had to choose Sunday night. So. And, and if you come to the night, I'm sorry. <laughs>
today there's camp. Kids <coughs> camp. There's lots of kids going to camp today, so it's going to be kind of chaotic after the third service out in the back and front here because we've got 36 kids going up to high school camp to Wildwood um, with six adults. So all of those guys are going to be at the back there. And then we've got 19 kids going to the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade camp uh, up at Heartland with four adults. So that will be all gathering in the front. So hopefully, We'll get all the luggage in the right vehicles so that we don't end up with some at Hume and some at Hartland. That's not supposed to be there. Hopefully, the right people in the right places. Um, so, that's what's happening later today. That would be exciting. So, please keep them in your prayers as you pray this week because you know, this is a very important time for kids uh, this, this time of the year. Camp is one of those things where they just get total immersion into the Word uh, and they're surrounded by people that just want to teach you. And it's, it's a unique opportunity in the year for them to just get to know a lot more than they knew before, to really get a deeper understanding of what it is to be in Jesus Christ, and many of them take that step, and it's exciting to see it, and it's exciting to be a part of it when it happens. So please pray for that, pray that they will be open minds for this, and, um, and that they will fully understand what it is, and not just have that experience at camp, then come back down the mountain, and then a week later they will all like, forgotten. But, um, that they will really stick with them. And the, the, the stuff that they do at camp is designed to help keep an ongoing relationship, not just have that great week and then, and then not so good after that. So, uh, so keep them in your prayers. There's a lot of kids at camp, so that's, that's very, very good to see. And that's not just it. Junior High went earlier in the summer. So you know, this, this year from you, we've seen a large number of people at camp. On August 4th, in the bulletin, it talks about Disciple 13, that Randy Robinson plays the piano, it's his group. Uh, there'll be the details of that in the, uh, there's details of that in the bulletin, so if you have any questions, just chat with him, but it's there and it'd be well worth going to see. That's at North Point Church, which is on the other side of town. Uh, prime timers, that's not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday on the 8th, so if you are 55 plus, think about going to that, put it on the calendar. This this month will be uh, the CEO and founder of Valley Team Ranch, Tony Clendenon, will be speaking. Uh, that'll be very interesting. So listen to, if you've never been before, just turn up. If you've been before, you kind of know what to do. As far as the that's good. Um, August 26th, it's going to be a very busy day on campus here, because we've got combined, well it's not combined, it's separate, but two ministries working on campus at the same time. The women have a movie in the afternoon, that's at 3 p.m. And then uh, once they get out of the movie, the men would be doing a rib and chili cook-off. Some of the men will be doing the rib cook-off in the grass area outside the bridge. That's because they want to bring their barbecues and they want to trash talk each other because that's what we do <laughs> So there'll be a lot of competition out there. Other people are just going to do it at home and bring the ribs, and that's fine too. The chili, obviously, I know it's a fine art creating the great chili, so you probably want to do that at home and then bring it at 5 p.m. So 5 p.m. on the 26th, we'll have rib and chili tasting and judging. Some of the women from the movie might want to go out there and become judges, because I know the men love to be judged by the women. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an opportunity for women right there. And uh, there's also meals available. So we're doing a fundraiser at the same time. There'll be try to on the barbecue out here, and there'll be uh, an opportunity to pay ten dollars for a ticket that we'll be selling out the building in the next three weeks. Uh, you buy a ticket for ten dollars, you get a tri-tip dinner that you can take with you, or you can eat here. So we'll have tables out at the building, you can eat that here, or you can take it home to your family. There'll be a star for uh, So women, when you're coming out of the movie, you can have to pick up dinner and take it, or you can stay and uh, eat it here. Or your husbands can come join your family, or whatever. Anyway, so that will be available to you. The money that we're raising from those tri-tip dinners is going to go to uh, restore the trailer barbecue that we have on the other side of the bridge, so we can use it a little more than we have been, so probably we can take places uh, like Man Camp. And that's a perfect segue into Man Camp, <laughs> which is on October 20th through the 22nd. Uh, we have eight RV and uh, trailer hookups there, so if you have an RV or a trailer, you want to stop there. We have eight, six already taken, so let me know if you need one of those. Uh, and also put it on your calendar, men. It's not a retreat. It's just a very low pressure thing because we, you know, men don't like being told what to do, so <laughs> where to do it. So we're just going to have free time, and if you do what you want to do, you can go hiking, you can go fishing, you can go boating, whatever it takes your fancy, you can hang out at the camp. Um, the 
only thing that we ask is that you're available Friday night for a short devotion, and we'll have a um, we'll have some time sharing, and then there'll be Saturday night what we'll in the wilderness service, which is yeah. worship, prayer, and there'll be a, a sermon that night as well. So even if you're not up there for man camp, man, if you want to come up for that evening, come, we'll let you know more about the time soon. But come up, spend the evening up there, and then come back down to ready to be fresh for church the next day. So. Um, so there's an opportunity yeah. to do that. Uh, what else we got on here? That is it. Okay, we have some prayer requests. Um, for Kalpakov, had some heart issues this week. Um, we don't know if he actually had to step put in or not, but he was scheduled to have one put in. Uh, he's now part of the so kind of being too bad. I don't think he's doing much up there. They were scheduled to go anyway, so he is out of hospital when he is up there. So, so keep him in your prayers. Um, Mike Garamonte gave me a, a request this morning to say a prayer for his parents. No, Rose Garamonte, uh, health is declining rapidly. So just ask for, for comfort for his family and for his parents in your prayers. Um, Mark Downs uh, recently lost a niece. Uh, she was 12 years old. 12. So please keep his family in prayer. Um, he was on vacation at the time. It's very difficult when you're not here. When that kind of thing happens, so just pray for his family and also the Shasky family. Tom Shasky, um, Tom Shasky's father died this week. He had ALS, um, so just keep them in your prayers as well. Uh, so this morning I have to pray for us. There's a representative from a high school camp that's going today, and that is Justin, who's supposed to be already here. <laughs> Uh, and stay on each side of uh, this new grandson. All 
something. Okay. Turn it off and then we'll turn it back on. Carry on. I'll, I'll get you. 
You'll Carry on. on. She has a ready. She's oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Every time I come to church, I look around and I think to myself, I am by far the most attractive woman in this church. <laughs> but I can't seem to stop this thought every week, so I need to come to you to get some suggestions on how to stop it. So the pastor kind of looked at her, thoughtfully though, and said, My dear, you have been sinning. You've just been mistaken. <laughs> Samuel, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as other nations have. 
But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to him, listen to all that people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they're rejecting me as a king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving only other gods so that they, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his right. The key line here is such as all other nations have. Here's the illustration that they've been looking around to the left and to the right, to other nations, and they felt that they need a human king in the same way that they have it. Because as God said, they have rejected me as their king. And so he says, warn them that the king will apply all kinds of pressure to them. He'll tax them and have other human expectations on them. But if they persist, grant their wish. And so the king was anointed, not God's representative. Samuel was already God's representative, but their king from their wish. It's interesting that they trusted Samuel in all things, small and big. But when it came to this particular thing, they didn't want to listen to him. Comparison with other nations was driving them to blindness, and they couldn't see what maybe they were better off before. Well, as expected, the Israelites' experience with King Saul eventually became just as Samuel had predicted. And so God had Samuel anoint another king, David. David wasn't perfect, but he had a true heart for God. So while we're talking about David, let's look at another comparison. Imagine the soldiers on the battlefield as they faced off against a giant called Goliath when David steps up. 1 Samuel 17.4 gives a good description of Goliath. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. That's nine foot nine inches, roughly. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, about 125 pounds. And on his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin that was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a, rod, a weaver's rod, and the iron point weighed 600 shekels, about 15 pounds. And that's quite a picture, definitely a picture of a powerful and big man to be facing down. David was the youngest of his brothers and kind of an afterthought for his father, not quite as strapping as his brothers. And in 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul said, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior since his youth. Saul even tries to put his own armor on David, but it's too big and it's too heavy and he can't move as well as he needs to move. So David goes to face to face with this giant and all of the soldiers on both sides, the Philistines and the Israelites, could not help comparing each, other, each of their experience as well as their stature. And they would have drawn their own conclusion. David's going to be crushed. The story, now, as we know, takes a slightly different turn, but the fact is, when God is involved, there is no comparison to be had. David was on God's pathway, and it, was a matter of, it didn't matter if he was smaller, weaker, or he didn't have any armor. He had with him the armor of God. It's easy to use comparison to make ourselves feel better. I'm going to use the illustration of a car, because most people have one. So we look at our car and we look at it and go, radio doesn't work, the door doesn't close properly, the paint might not be very good anymore, and everything's just looking a little worn. So we're driving along, we stop at a light, we look over, and next to us is a 1984 Honda Civic. And I'm just going to pick on 1984 Honda Civics for a second. Nothing wrong with Honda Civics. They're representative of cars from 1984. So you look at its age and it's worn and it's a slight knocking from under the hood and you, you think, well, maybe my car's not so bad. It feels pretty luxurious at this point. So we use these comparisons to make ourselves feel better. But in the process of elevating ourselves and giving ourselves a feeling of superiority, there is one problem. Because at the next light, you could just as easily pull up and there's a brand new Range Rover next to you and suddenly our car doesn't look good at all. So even though we have complaints that it runs, it's clean, the registration is cheap, but by comparison, now it looks run down, broken, and worn out. It doesn't feel good anymore. But also think of it from the driver of the Honda Civic's experience. He may have been without a car for three years, getting a bus everywhere he goes, and he's finally managed to afford to get a car. And he's driving, and he's feeling pretty good about this. And he glances over at your car and thinks, wow, that's, that's a pretty nice car. And suddenly his car doesn't seem as shiny as new as it was before. And that's because the quickest way to ruin something good is to compare it to something else. 
A crow lived in the forest and was absolutely satisfied in life. But one day he saw a swan. The swan is so perfect and graceful, he thought, and I'm so dull. The swan must be the happiest bird in the world. He expressed these thoughts to the swan, and the swan replied, I was feeling that I was the happiest bird in the world until I saw a parrot, which has two colors instead of my one, and now I think the parrot must be the happiest bird on the planet. The crow then approached the parrot, and the parrot explained, Well, I lived a very happy life until I saw a peacock. I have only two colors, but the peacock has many colors. The crow then visited the peacock in the zoo and saw hundreds of people gathered around its cage. After people had left, the crow approached the peacock and said, Dear peacock, you are so beautiful. Every day, thousands of people come to see you. And the peacock says, I always thought that I was the most beautiful and happy bird in the world. But because of my beauty, I'm entrapped in this cage at the zoo. I've examined the zoo very carefully, and I realized that the crow is the only bird not in a cage. So for the past few days, I've been thinking, if I were a crow, I could happily roam anywhere and everywhere. So the quickest way to ruin something good is to compare it to something else. And the comparison problem is, is prevalent in most areas of our lives, and Facebook and other social media has given us a front row seat to, into the lives of family and friends, and it comes with an opportunity to compare our lives to others, but herein lies the problem. Pastor Stephen Furtick from South Carolina put it best when he said, the problem is we compare our behind the scenes with everybody else's highlight reel. And that's because of social media, right? It's the highlight reel of people's lives. Because people don't generally write on Facebook, oh, my, my son got a D in math, or he came last in the track meet. Or they don't say, I was counseled at work for laziness today instead of getting a good promotion. <clears throat> I mean, why would you do that? No one wants to air their dirty laundry in public. Well, well them generally. There's always some that have this random stream of consciousness <clears throat> online, but... So the highlights of our lives, or the highlights of other people's lives is what we see, not their lowlights. The triumphs, not the losses, the good pictures, the ones that don't make us look too crazy, too fat, too angry, or just not Facebook type pictures. I don't want to pick on social media, but I'm going to today because every single article that I read about comparison says social media is a major contributor now. Because that's the image we get of people, especially in summer. And it says in these articles, summer is particularly bad because, you know, that's when people are out doing stuff. Their news feeds is full of vacations and great places here or overseas. And they're having a good time. And we're sitting there at six o'clock in the evening in our pajamas eating two-day-old food, <laughs> watching a TV show thinking, I'm having a good night in. But then we go on Facebook, we see our friends are out in Hawaii eating lobster tail with a deep tan surrounded by other friends, suddenly it makes our night seem a little sad. Because the quickest way to ruin something good is to compare it to something else. The chances are you've been satisfied with your life until you look to the le left and to the right and see that someone else is doing something better than you or doing something more exciting than you are, and suddenly you feel less satisfied. In fact, you can become positively miserable when it wasn't even really a possibility before. A good salesman figured out the comparison game and closed hundreds of sales with the line, let me show you something several of your neighbors said you couldn't afford. <laughs> Comparing yourself to others can be poison. But even Jesus' disciples were not immune to this. Craig Rochelle, who's a pastor in Texas and, a, and an author, he likes to talk about the relationship between Peter and John. And they were very big on comparison. He, he said that he didn't think they liked each other very much, but actually I think they probably did. They were very competitive with each other, and I think it was a, a friendly co competition. But they were just as susceptible to the, to the dangers of comparison. So we'll go to John chapter 20, and we'll look at the scenario here, which is that Mary Magdalene has gone to the tomb on the third day and found that the stone has been rolled away, and there's nothing inside. She doesn't know what's happened, so she takes off running to go meet with John and Peter. The fact that they're together, and only them, 
kind of implies that, yeah, they did like each other. They were hanging out together um, at the time. So we look at chapter 20, and just before we start, I just want to point out, John refers to himself in the third person all the time. He doesn't, which is kind of annoying. I don't know if you know people that do that, but it is a little annoying. But uh, not only that, he calls himself the one Jesus loves. So right there, he's kind of elevated himself. It's like, the one Jesus loved. So, so that kind of sets the scene right there with John. So in verse 4, well, let's go back to verse 3. It says, so Peter and the other disciple, that's John, started for the tomb. So they were both standing there. Mary runs up, and they both they hear what's happened, so they start for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, that's John, got there first. So he outran Peter. Literally said he outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Very important piece of information for John to write in here for him. Jesus has risen from the dead, the single most important thing in the history of the world. But John wants to make sure that we know he got to the tomb first. <laughs> so you think that's fine. No, we know that. It's all good. So he carries on, and then we get to verse 6. Then Simon Peter came along behind him. Just in case you didn't catch it in verse 4, John's like, he was behind me not in front, and went straight into the tomb. Okay. So he just wanted to make a point. But then we go to verse 8. Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first. <laughs> it's almost bordering on obsession at this point. Also went inside. So this is a pretty hefty comparison. Uh, competitiveness between John and Peter. And John really, really wanted us to know that he got to the tomb first. So John's obviously a faster runner than Peter. And that's fine. So we can leave that until we get to chapter 21. And then it kind of starts again. The disciples here, you know, Jesus, their disciples are out in a boat, they're fishing, they're having a bad day fishing, which a lot of people I know can, can uh, understand. So Jesus is on the shore, and he shouts at them, throw your nets on the other side. So they did, and then they started catching fish, 153. But then John says, the one Jesus loved, so John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. You know, he's very specific. that He was the one that said this. He was the first one that spotted Jesus and, and recognized him as the Lord, because it was kind of distant, so they didn't really... They might not have been able to recognize him necessarily, but he was the first one, wrote it in here, the one that Jesus loved, said to Peter, and not just to all the disciples, to Peter specifically, it is the Lord. But then Peter jumps into the water and swims to the shore, and the way that John writes it is a little bit kind of, well, Peter jumped in the water, swam to the shore, and the rest of the disciples just stayed in the boat. How undignified of him to do that. So they settled down with Jesus after that to have a meal. Well, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And he's talking about the rest of the disciples. Remember, Jesus had been denied by Peter three times after his arrest. First time, you know, the servant girl comes up, says, weren't you one of the ones that was with, with Jesus? And Peter's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so the first denial, and then he goes on to do two more. So this is, that's the first time Jesus really says, do you love me? And he says, you know that I love you, Lord. So Jesus replies, feed my lambs. Then Jesus asks a second time, do you love me? And again he replies, you know that I love you, Lord. And he says, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he asks again, do you love me? And Peter replies, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus replied, feed my sheep. But then after this conversation... You know, he established three times, so it's kind of the reinstatement of Peter after the three denials. So that's fine. You asked me three times whether I love you, and I responded. And then, and then he turns around, and he sees John, and he says, what about him? Now, it's Peter who's like, what about him? I love you, obviously. I've told you three times, but what does he have to say? 
And Jesus' reply is great on this because he basically says, mind your own business. Stop this comparison. He literally says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So here's a case where there's no winning when it comes to comparison. Jesus made it abundantly clear to Peter that his role, his job, was to be the shepherd. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. But John, he has a different task. Peter wants to compare himself, but Jesus set him straight. What is that to you? He has his pathway, so you don't need to be worrying about what it is that John's going to be doing. And in the same way, we have paths that we need to follow. These are God-given. And our pathway is not the same as the person around us. We don't need to be looking to our left and to our right. I don't know how many people in here did track in like high school or college or even beyond that. Specifically sprinting, short sprints. Because when you're doing sprinting, you take off from the start line. How many, how many times do you look to the left and the right while you're running? You don't. You don't have time. I mean, in longer races, you might do that. You compare yourselves to those around you, see what your pace is and see, see what's going on and where the positioning is. But in fast races, you, all you can do is look at the finish line and you just focus on that. Your sole goal is to get across that line as quickly as possible and hopefully faster than the rest. There's no need to look to the left and right. If you notice someone passes you, they're going to be in front of you, so you're going to see them kind of anyway. But the prize lies at the end of the line, that line at the end of your running lane. And in life, that lane has been assigned specifically to you. You can't run anybody else's race in life. God has given you the lane, and in order to get to the end of that race and to cross that line, he's given you the tools and everything that you need to get across it. But what's the prize? The prize is Jesus Christ. We must focus ourselves and run our race with Jesus as the thing that we keep our eyes on. So just as in a race, we can look to the end, the finish line, and in this case, Jesus. Looking to the left and the right isn't going to achieve anything. The people alongside you have their own challenges, their own goals, their own races that they have to do, and God's given them the skills to do that. Some will choose not to run that race. Some will run straight and quick. Others may decide to join after some time and join halfway, across, halfway through and, and then finish. But ultimately, worrying about what they are doing is not going to help you to win your race. Now, don't get me wrong, you can help other people get along their path. You can encourage them and you can help them with wherever you can. But if you're comparing your pathway to theirs, it's not going to get you anywhere. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26 says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like somebody running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. You know, when Paul wrote this, he was being very sensitive. He was always very sensitive to the audiences that he was writing to, and in this case, it was the church at Corinth. Corinth was a place that held Greek games on the year before and the year after the Olympics. So this was kind of near and dear to their heart. So when he talked about a running race, they kind of understood it. And they understood this, this need to run straight. In particular, this passage ties into the discipline. It takes discipline to stay focused. And with top athletes, when they compete, they have a laser-like focus on what it is that they're doing to help them get into what's described as the zone. And this is a place where they're thinking of nothing else except what it takes to complete the task at hand in the most efficient and, if necessary, the quickest way. But that isn't the mental process that takes place on the day that they compete. There's something that requires a lot of input from a lot of different areas over a long period of time. Discipline is in diet, in training, in mental preparation, and by honing technique. This takes a large amount of focus, discipline, and determination. They cannot afford to be distracted. A 100-meter runner is not going to train in the same way as a high jumper. So we need to make sure that we're focused on our own path and that our focus is on the line. God determines what our race is, and if we embrace that direction that he gives us, then we'll find it's much easier to get to the finish line. Comparison can be dangerous in a lot of areas of our life, but let's look at one in particular because it has particular um, danger in this area, and that's marriage. 
There can be three traps that you can fall into when you start bringing comparison into a marriage. The first one is comparing your success to others, and that's your success as a couple, not necessarily individual. It's the whole idea of keeping up with the Joneses. It's not a new idea, and we talked about how, you know, this, this days of social media magnify the highlight reels of other people's lives. But the reality is that we all progress and hit, hit benchmarks in different ways and at different times. Success defined by one person or by a couple may not be the same as the next. It's far too easy to look around and feel like you're not measuring up. Perhaps you feel like you're not making enough money. Perhaps you didn't get that big promotion. Or your business is failing when it seems like everybody else is, is flourishing. Dave Ramsey, the founder of Financial Peace University, talks about the concept of the appearance of success by keeping up with the Joneses. He says, we all know the Joneses. They're the ones who just got back from a two-week trip in Europe, dragging suitcases full of souvenirs. They drive their 2.5 kids to a private school in their new car, and every weekend they head out of town fashionably dressed and go to their favorite restaurants. No budget, no worries, they've got it all, or so it seems. The fact is, statistically, they don't. Seven out of 10 families in America are living paycheck to paycheck. That means if they miss one paycheck, bills literally would go unpaid. They may look like they've got it all together, but realistically and statistically, they don't. And then he goes on, life may, may seem peachy on the outside of their perfect house in their perfect neighborhood, but if you knew what was really going on behind closed doors, you wouldn't want to trade places with them. What are you likely to find inside is a lot of heartache, money fights, and fear about how bills will get paid. The vacation isn't so much fun when you're paying it off two years later, and driving that new car isn't as much fun when you're trying to scrape together a $450 car payment with job loss looming and a house in foreclosure. So remember what I said earlier about your behind the scenes and their highlight reels. This applies here. You're running a unique race with unique people. Your life isn't meant to look the same as the people next door. So comparison is a waste of time. And frankly, comparison of success based on limited information and outward appearance. Run your race with your people. I focused on this one, money, because it is a major problem in marriages. It's one of the top. I also focused on this because financial peace is coming up September the 17th. And Dave Ramsey, I just quoted him. So, um, so if you want to participate in that, email me. The second trap is comparing your spouse to other men and women. There's fewer things that can destroy a marriage faster than comparison of a spouse. You're, you married your spouse for their unique strengths and personality. You said your vows and made a sacred commitment in front of God. And your family and your spouse may not necessarily complete you. And they're more than like, likely never fully meet your, your needs. But there'll be days or even seasons when you just don't seem to be get, able to get on the same page. The reality is that no one will fulfill a role that is unrealistic. But for the most dangerous thing you can do is compare your spouse to another man or a woman. It takes your focus on God's greatest gift. And it takes us into a very false reality. The third trap is the happiness comparison. Have you ever heard, the, heard yourself say, they're so happy. They never fight. They just seem to have it all. These are very dangerous and distorted views of reality. Perhaps try asking yourself the question, is my happiness really the point in marriage? Maybe a controversial question. It's okay to be happy in marriage. It's okay to want to be happy in marriage, and that's, that's a good goal to have. But at its core, marriage exists to display God's glory. Aside from the church, it's the only institution that, was, that God created, and it's a sacred union chosen by a couple designed for two people to join together not to compare themselves to other flawed couples around them. But what we must do is live together for the glory of God. And if this is our goal, and we focus on the end of our own race lane with this in mind, then the comparison will fall out of our lives naturally. No marriage is perfect because it's two imperfect people together. However, if we, pos if we focus on the positive sides of each other and understand that God's goal in marriage... What, what that is, then everything else will pale by comparison. So is it all bad? Is comparison all bad? Should we never ever look at others and compare ourselves? Well, I believe there's a couple of exceptions to this. 
The first one is that we should compare ourselves when there's something to be learned. If you have a mentor, someone in the same industry, in the same interest and pastime as you, or the same season of life. In other words, they're running a similar race to you. Not the same race, because we don't have the same race, but a similar race. Then yes, there's some value to comparison in that. After all, you want to get better at something, you watch other people who are good at it so that you can get better. But also when you do that, don't let them set your own level of achievement. There's plenty of times when so-called experts will say, well, that's impossible in this scenario until somebody does it. The Wright brothers were told it's impossible to fly a heavier-than-air plane as opposed to a balloon. If they'd just listened to that and said, oh, well, I'm not going to bother then, be limited by somebody else's opinion, then they wouldn't have got as far as they did. The second exception is maybe for inspiration. If you're working with a coworker doing the same job, they get promoted, it's easy to think to yourself by comparison, oh, I'm bitter about that. Why wasn't it me? It's not fair. Or you could genuinely celebrate their success and think to yourself, you know what, now I know that this job can lead to somewhere. I'm inspired because I know that I can get promoted out of this job upwardly. Let's look at the analogy of a marathon runner, Eric. Do they admire the accomplishment of other marathoners, if that's a word, marathon runners, who complete the race faster than they do or in times that they po no way they could possibly ever dream of doing? I'm sure they do. You think to yourself, that would be great. But does any, do most marathon runners don't start out with the goal of finishing first? Most of them just start out with the goal of finishing, period, but a lot of them just want to better their time. So comparison should and can work that way. So you're going to do it anyway because it's just human nature. So you might as well have it ultimately serve as great motivation. But you have to be careful with the traps. So rather than using it to beat yourself up, use comparison to build yourself up. The last area of good use of comparison that I want to cover is very much inwardly. This is not comparison with other people. But this is comparing our own lives with and without Christ. I know that some of you won't have that comparison yet, but I know many of us do. If you have Christ in your life as your finish line, compare what your life is like now compared to what it was like without Christ. Personally, I can tell you my life looks nothing like it did. I compare now what I have and I have a peace that goes way beyond anything I could have had back then. I mean, I'm a pastor. Ten years ago, that would have been inconceivable to me. For some of you, you may not remember life without Christ because you gave your life to Christ at such a young age, and that's great. Then maybe this comparison isn't for you. But think back to a life without having the assurance that comes from knowing that Jesus is a central part of everything you do, and no matter what life throws at you, we still have the strength to endure it. It can be a hopeless journey through life knowing that we will not weather the storms or we may not weather the storms. But it's a whole different story when you're going through life knowing that Jesus is your lifeblood. John 15, 4 and 5 says, Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have many people at our church who have great and powerful testimonies. And they talk about their life before and after Christ. And we'll have some of those people share testimonies on Sunday nights once we start doing it weekly. Because it's very inspirational to hear. And I can show you that they're very happy to share those stories because their life before Christ, in comparison to what their life is like in Christ, is extraordinary. And they want to share it with others because it's life-changing. It can be the difference between addiction and being clean. It can be the difference between being incarcerated and being free. It can be the difference between being on the brink of suicide and then having hope. It's the difference between worshipping the almighty dollar of which they are never enough and worshipping a God who provides all sufficiency. 
So if you want to compare anything, look at your life without Christ and compare it to your life with Christ. If you're still in life without Christ, take that step. Be bold. Don't wait for the right time in your eyes because it's always the right time in God's eyes. And if you do that, then you will have a comparison that's worth something. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to keep our eyes on the prize, to stay in our lane, not to be distracted by the left, by the right, by others. Help us to look at others, celebrate their success, not compare it to where we're at. Help us to understand that we have a goal, that we have a lane that we need to stay in, and distractions will only take us away from that purpose. And we thank you for giving Jesus as the prize because with that, there can only be extraordinary motivation. There can only be a life that's full of hope, that's full of the promise of salvation. And what better prize could we possibly hope for? We thank you, Lord, for all the tools that you give us to get through this life. And we know we're on the right path when these tools are just the right ones at the right time and the right people in our lives at the right time. Help us with this trap of comparison. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Or not. Mark, great job today. Thank you. I want to apologize for those of you who may be busy with us today. We don't usually have so many technical issues, all right? What you may not know is we've just done a fair amount of remodel work in here, and sound just got reconnected Thursday of this week. So we are still working out some of the bugs with that. So I apologize for some of the distractions. Those will be uh, remedied on confident this week. Milo's been down here many, many hours trying to get through the day. So we apologize. Thank you for being here, Mark. Great job. Great job.